Hello lovely viewers, you are most welcome to our channel Poetry Online. In this video, we shall be discussing the detailed analysis of Nine Song City by Dennis Brutus. Kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates on all our new videos. Once again, let us assure you of a very interesting discussion. Get ready for this lesson. Dennis Brutus was a South African political activist, poet, and scholar, best known for his work with the anti apartheid movement. He first gained notoriety in the 1960s as a founding member of the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee when he initiated a successful international boycott of the South African's racially exclusive team from the Olympic Games. Arrested and jailed many times for his activism, Brutus and his family went into exile in 1966 eventually settling in the United States of America. As a scholar, Brutus taught at the University of Denver, Northeastern University, and the University of Pittsburgh, receiving honorary degrees from Worcester State University, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Northeastern University. Brutus published 12 collections of poetry and contributed articles and commentary to multiple publications throughout his life. He eventually returned to South Africa, where he remained active in teaching and social justice issues until his death. Nine Song City is a short poem of only nine lines, making up just one sentence. It is nevertheless a very handsome and powerful poem on account of his tone and imagery. The poem is set in South Africa in the time of apartheid when the disenfranchised black majority fighting for their freedom were subjected to very inhuman and degrading treatment from the white South African government, particularly from the police, the watchdog of the regime. Until the early 1990, white people ruled South Africa through a system called apartheid Apartheid means separateness in the African language. The laws of the apartheid system classify people according to three major racial groups, that is, whites, Bantu, and people from mixed descent. Under the apartheid system, one's skin color determined where one could live, the job he or she could do, and what type of education he or she receives. The apartheid system prohibited most social contact between races and denied any representation of non-whites in government. To show their discontentment, the black population resorted to revolt in Soweto and other black townships in South Africa. This resulted in the unlawful arrest and imprisonment of so many nationalists, including Nelson Mandela. Freedom fighters who carried out raids on installation of the apartheid government, as well as non-combatant supporters, were hunted down like animals by the security forces of the South African government, and if caught, were tortured and often murdered by the police, or, if convicted, they were hanged. Indeed, the decades before 1994, when the first government elected by Universal Adult Suffrage and June Pa were a dark and violent period in South Africa. The apartheid system were particularly oppressive for the blacks in the following ways. 1. The blacks were forbidden from living in white areas. They could work in white areas only if they had a permit. 2. Trains, buses, taxis, hotels, hospitals, schools and colleges, libraries, cinema halls, theaters, beaches, swimming pools, public toilets, and other social amenities were all separate for blacks and whites. 3. The blacks could not visit churches where the whites worshipped. 4. The blacks could not form associations or protest against the terrible system of apartheid. It is during this period that Dennis Brussels was imprisoned on Robben Island for his anti-apartheid activities and the poem Nine Song City was written in response to those terrifying times in the country. The poem is actually a love poem, in which paradoxically, the poet expresses love for his country, which is rugged 
and made almost unlovable by violence and injustice. Thus, the central conflict of the poem is to be found in the opposition between the poet's loving attitude to his country and the cruel and ugly character of the place politically. Thus, the contrast in this poem lies in the gentleness of the persona's tone and the harshness of the environment. Let's take our first reading of the poem. Sleep well, my love, sleep well. The harbor lights glaze over restless dogs. Police cars cockroach through the tunnel streets. From the shanty's creaking iron sheets, violence like a bug infested rag is tossed, and fear is imminent as sound in the wind swung bell. The long day's anger pants from the sun and rocks, but for this breathing night at least, my land, my love, sleep well. Let's take a second reading of the poem. Sleep well, my love, sleep well. The harbor lights glaze over restless dogs. Police cars cockroach through the tunnel streets. From the shanty's creaking iron sheets, violence like a bug infested rag is tossed. And fear is imminent as sound in the wind swung bell. The long day's anger pants from the sun and rocks. But for this breathing night at least, my land, my love, sleep well. After reading the poem for the second time, let's try to analyze this poem stanza by stanza, starting with the first stanza. Sleep well, my love. Sleep well. The harbor light gives over the restless dogs. Police cars cockroach through the tunnel streets. The poem begins almost like a lullaby, wishing the speaker's love to sleep well. The implied love here as a country of the persona, or the land of the persona. The tone of the poem creates a peaceful image that one will associate with sleep, rest, or peace. However, when you read the second and third line, the persona presents various sinister images of violence in the poem, words such as glaze, restless dog, and cockroach conveys the intense atmosphere in the poem. The speaker equally personifies harbor lights as looking out without any emotion. The streets are said to be patrolled by the police cars. Hence, there is little or no chance of escape. Cockroach, as used in the poem, suggests that the police move in a menacing way as they patrol the streets, hinting us on a potential police brutality or violence. What it simply means is that the speaker thinks that the police is unwelcome in the shanty towns. They are like pests, unhealthy, dirty, and disgusting. The imagery in this stanza suggests conflict, danger, and violence. The repetition of sleep well, addressed to a being, which the persona calls my love, is suiting in its effect. The reader might be very well supposed that the persona is addressing a loved one, perhaps a dear one of the opposite sex. But the next two lines of the poem, which together with the first line, comprises the first stanza of the three stanza poem, introduces a rather harsh picture. The harbor lights glaze over restless dogs. Police cars cuckoo through the tunnel streets. These lines give a picture of the society in which the persona is wishing his beloved to sleep well and one can tell that it is not a peaceful world. One imagines powerful harbor lights sweeping the dockyards, hoping to catch fugitive figures of freedom fighters, perhaps unloading arms, or sneaking into the country to carry out some covert operation against the government. And in the darkest streets of the city, police cars crawl about like cockroaches at night in search of criminals, most probably, Heroes of the liberation struggle. The fact that the police cars are compared to cockroaches indicate the persona's attitude to the police as a whole, who are likened to vermin. Similarly, the comparison of the city streets to tunnels suggests that, in the night, the streets look like tunnels in which the police, like cockroaches, 
crawl disgustingly about. Let's move to the second stanza. From the shanties of creaking iron sheaves, violence like a bag infested rag is tossed, and fear is imminent, a sound in the wind swung bell. In this second stanza, we have an undertone of violence and fear. The shanties in this stanza are built from creaking iron sheaves, suggesting abject poverty. Just as the speaker hears the creaking shanties every now and then due to the wind, he also hears a fear which is imminent everywhere in black townships in South Africa. This persistent fear is as common as the sound of the bell that is caught in the wind. Thus, the speaker's fear is real as the sound of a ringing bell. His fear springs from poverty, inequality, and police brutality brought about by the appetite system. The second stanza presents pictures of the township at night. This is, of course, where the deprived South Africans live, or where the deprived Africans live. It is a place of tin shacks and corrugated iron sheaths, which creak and ground in the wind. It is also a place of endemic violence, particularly violence of the kind that is associated with poverty, drunken fights, gang warfare, ill treatments of women, armed robbery, and of course, police brutality. Although this is a place where life is cheap and where people live in constant fear of violent death, the poise imagery is particularly powerful here. Violence, he says, is like a bag-infested rag, something diseased and unhygienic which spreads contagions, and fear is something which rings incessantly in the ear like a wind-swung bell. Let's move to the third stanza. The long day's anger pants from sand and rocks, but for this breeding night at least, my land, my love, Sleep well. The use of panting in the third stanza means that South Africa is yearning for freedom, or the blacks in South Africa are yearning for freedom from the apartheid system. In spite of the violence and chaos in the previous lines, the persona still bears his beloved country to at least rest during the night and take a break from the violence and brutality that characterize the apartheid system. This stanza expresses the speaker's yearning or longing for peace for his beloved country. The use of the word bad creates a contrasting scene of the nighttime in South Africa and daytime in South Africa in black townships. Also, we equally find this interesting lines in the poem. My land, my love, sleep well. These lines are very affectionate. This shows the speaker's love for his land. This almost feels like the love a parent has for his child. My land, my love, sleep well. The concluding three lines of the poem begin by picking up on the images of violence. The day, which is now entered, is described as one that pans from the sand and rocks. The resentment against appetite system seems to issue from the very sand and rocks of the natural landscape. Nature itself, during the day, seemed to scream in anger against appetite's injustice. But for this brief moment, during this night, the violence and anger seems to have subsided and the poet is able to bid his beloved country to sleep well. This poem is not addressed to another human being, but to the land it is South Africa herself, worn out by the day's violence and settling down to the night's nice uneasy rest, which the poets bid a loving good night. Sadly, the poet knows only too well that, after the night's nice respite, the morrow or the next morning will only bring more appetite injustice and violence. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share this video.